Well, folks, good evening. A really warm welcome to our evening service here from the Burkhead Free Church building. Uh, my name's Peter. I'm the minister here in Burkhead. But of course, uh, these evening services are joint with our friends at Elgin Free Church as well. So whoever you are and uh, wherever in Scotland or in the world that you're watching, welcome. Uh, we come today to the, the start of a new series. We're going to be looking at uh, the Song of Songs. The series title is The Love of Loves in the Song of Songs. It's an intriguing book of the Bible. It's not often preached, but it has a message which is uh, essential for our world and our culture today. We come, though, not just to hear from God, but uh, to speak words of prayer and of praise to him. If you want to be guided through our service, you could go to burkheadfreechurch.org forward slash Sunday service. You can download a service sheet there. And if you have that sheet, you'll see that we're going to begin uh, with the words of Psalm 136 uh, in the Scottish Psalter. Give thanks to God for good is he. He has uh, shown us mercy and faithfulness. So let's praise him together. It's good to sing together. We're going to come now to God in prayer. And uh, here's uh, Abby, a member of our church family, to lead us in those prayers. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we thank you so much that you are a faithful and good God, a kind and a strong God, a merciful, gracious and loving God. We thank you that you invite us to come to you with our concerns and our fears and our joys and our sorrows. Lord, we thank you that you know all of what we experience, all of what we feel. You know what's coming ahead of us, you know what's been behind us, and you're with us through all of it. Lord Father God, you know the times that we're in just now, there's been uh, much uncertainty. We look out into the wider world and we see um, big and serious uh, issues affecting uh, different parts of the world. Lord, we thank you that you're in control of all of it and that you are faithfully working out your good purposes. Lord Father God, I pray that you would bring peace and good judgment, wisdom in leadership to places like Israel and Palestine and to Belarus and to many other countries where we see Uh, evidence of um, rule that is not just or um, that is oppressive and particularly where it's oppressive to your people. Lord Father God we pray that you would cause your church to continue to grow and flourish Lord even where it faces opposition perhaps especially where it faces opposition. Lord please would you bless your people and cause your church to continue to grow. 
Father God, we thank you for your kindness and faithfulness to us here in Burkhead. We thank you for our church family and for the way that we are able to uh, love and encourage one another. Lord Father God, I thank you for being with us over the last year when church has been sort of disrupted and not um, not run the way that we want it to. We thank you for the opportunity now to gather back together on Sunday mornings. We pray that soon we'd be able to be joining together in person on Sunday evenings as well. But we thank you for new opportunities of online streaming and that those who are watching online would um, really feel uh, part of things as well, Lord, and that you would uh, bring uh, more people in to join us, perhaps through initially uh, joining in online, but then coming along to services and to meet with us as well. Lord Father God, we pray that uh, restrictions would continue to ease and there would be more and more opportunity to be able to meet together and share life together and uh, enjoy uh, in person um, praying and singing and, and, and hear, hearing together from your word. Dear Lord Father God, I thank you for the opportunities of Christian to explore and discipleship explored. I pray that you would bless those who are taking part in those courses, that they would learn um, more of you and Lord, that you'd uh, give them uh, faith or deepened faith in you, a true and right understanding of who you are and a, and a joyful desire to follow you. Dear Lord Father God, please would you be with us as we uh, come to hear your word uh, read and preached to us tonight. Please would you give us understanding, uh, would you help us to, to draw right conclusions uh, from your word and would you help us to uh, have a deeper love for you and a deeper desire to follow you faithfully as a result of uh, studying your word together now. Lord would you go with us um, and help us to live well for you. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Well thank you Abby. Uh, we come now to our reading, and uh, we're reading from the Song of Songs, chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. The book, Song of Songs. Song of Songs, chapter 1. She. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. Friends, we rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. She, how right they are to adore you. Dark am I, yet lovely. Daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards. My own vineyard I had to neglect. Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? Friends, if you do not know most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. He, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. She. While the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of Engedi. Well, we come to this uh, part of God's word, and let me pray that God would speak to us through it. Father, as we come to these uh, ancient words, no doubt unfamiliar to us, 
Lord, we pray that you'd open up our eyes and our ears to hear and see and understand what you would say to us. Lord, we live in a culture that is so confused about love and marriage and sex and about you. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to us, that we would know your will for us on these important topics. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, picture the scene. A middle-aged man sits with his head in his hands, filled with hopeless despair. As he sits in his gloomy state, he wonders, where did it all go wrong? He knew it wasn't just the affair, it, it had started long before that, but now it seemed that there was just no hope. Or picture another scene, a young woman stands looking longingly out of the window, again hopelessness and despair churn within her. Here there has been no affair, no great conflict, no argument even, but it just seemed that her and her husband simply had nothing left in common. Their marriage, which had been starved of attention and devoid of conversation for years, simply seemed to no longer exist. Or picture another scene, an older woman this time stands bereft of her friend for 40 years, She's no longer by her side. Words that were not really meant but that were spoken in anger seem to have caused a kind of irreparable break in this deep and precious friendship. These scenes are all imaginary. Except they're not. It didn't take much imagination to come up with them because unhealthy and broken relationships are played out all around us in every street, in every village, across our nation, every week. Relationships are so precious to us and yet in our sinful state they are so hard to get right. So what does the Bible have to say to us about our relationships? Does it have anything to say even about our intimate relationships, about marriage, about sex even? We would assume not. We, we would assume surely the Bible is too prudish to deal with these kind of topics. Well, if you think that, picture another scene now. In this scene, a, a teenage girl is engaged to be married to a young man from her village somewhere in the outskirts of Jerusalem. There's been a time of formal betrothal, but now everything is arranged and the couple are soon to be married. I say soon to be married. A wedding in those days lasts for a full seven days of feasting and dancing and singing. So they'll have to wait a little bit longer until they're actually married. <clears throat> that scene that you're now picturing is just the sort of place where the wedding band would strike up and the singers would sing the words of this book, the Song of Songs, a song for a wedding, a piece of intimate poetry about love, about marriage, about sex, and yes, about God, who's the giver of these good things. It is one of the least preached but most needed books in our society. Our culture, after all, is in a great mess and confusion about love and marriage and sex and God. When it comes to speaking about these kinds of subjects, our culture tends either towards prudishness or pornography. We're either too prudish to speak about them at all, or else we're at the other end of the spectrum. We, we commodify and cheapen sex and relationships and reduce them simply to lust. That kind of pornification of our culture is a huge problem. And so we need a better vision for love and marriage and sex and God. One that's not prudish nor pornographic. A vision that's beautifully painted for us in the Song of Songs. It's a book that features a number of characters in the poetry. And our passage today 
really introduces to us the four main characters. They are the woman, the man, the community, and God. And those will be our four headings tonight. We'll get to those in a moment. But briefly, before we do, I think we need to answer a few questions and dispel a few myths about this book. So before we get to our four points, here are our four questions. Question one, the Song of Songs, what is it? Well, to put it simply, it's like an anthology, a collection of love poetry, which records the intimate desires of a man and a woman who are pledged to be married. Now, if you're like me, when somebody mentions a collection of poetry, it it brings to mind sort of hideous memories of school English literature classes. If that's how you feel, or, or if, to be frank, poetry is just not the kind of thing you're into, I have some sympathy with you, but don't be too quick to judge. The fact is that the radio you listen to every day or the Spotify playlist you have almost certainly expose you to love poetry every day. 60% of pop songs are about love. In fact, we listen to love poetry every day. The question is, what message is this modern love poetry giving us? It's teaching us something about relationships. Is there any good? The answer on the whole is no. But here in the Song of Songs, we meet a piece of divinely inspired love poetry, which will bring the wisdom of God, instead of the wisdom of Ed Sheeran, to bear on this subject. Number two, who wrote this? Now, you might think the answer is obvious. You might think it's King Solomon. After all, verse one calls it Solomon's Song of Songs. However, Most likely, he is not the author. More literally, that verse says, the Song of Songs of Solomon. And most likely, that means it's not written by Solomon, but written in the style of Solomon or following the example of Solomon. You might know that Solomon, after all, wrote many songs and some psalms and and, and many pieces of wisdom literature, proverbs and so on. And the Song of Songs is wisdom literature in that style. Now, if you're curious why I don't think Solomon wrote it, the main reason lies in the content of the book as compared with Solomon's life. Here is a piece of love poetry that celebrates intimate, monogamous marriage. And sadly, we know Solomon went off the rails precisely because Well, his marriage was anything but monogamous, but that's another story. Questions three and four are these. Three, how should we understand it? And four, what on earth is it doing in the Bible? We can answer those questions together. Now, some people have treated this book like an allegory. Maybe they can't quite handle the fact that the Bible really does contain sexually charged love poetry. And so they think, oh, well, it it must really be about something else. It can't really be about two people in love. You know, it it must instead be all about uh, the love that God has for his people. Now, hear me carefully. The Song of Songs does have something to say about the love that God has for his people and the love that we are to have for God. That's true. But if we treat it just like an allegory, we'll make the mistake of assuming that that every word or verse must have some kind of coded meaning, which is really about God and not about human love. If we treat it that way, we'll pretty quickly get tied in knots, and the whole thing will get pretty weird pretty quickly. Now, the way to understand it is this. Here is a piece of intimate love poetry between a man and a woman. Now, that tells us, first of all, that that relationships, including intimate marriage relationships, are precious and important. In fact, if you are married, and I'm aware that not everybody is, but if you are, consider how important your marriage relationship is to your life. It's hugely important. And so maybe it's no surprise that God and his word would have something to say about that. As we step back a bit further, 
even if you're not married, this book will help to shape our thinking about marriage and about how important marriage is in our society and how we should all honour and uphold it. A step back a bit further still, and, and then we'll see how precious and important all human relationships are, how we are made for relationships. And so supremely, yes, when we stand right back from the book, the Song of Songs will also speak to us about the greatest relationship of all that we are made for, relationship with God himself. It will speak beautifully and poetically about the relationship of love that the church has with the Lord Jesus. That's how to approach it, and that's why it's in the Bible. Enough preamble, <laughs> let's dive in. Point number one, and character number one, the woman. Read from verse two. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. Make no bones about it. The woman desires the man. She wants him to kiss her. And this isn't just the kind of peck on a cheek you give to your granny when she visits. In case there's any doubt, she wants him to kiss her with the kisses of his mouth. She desires him. In fact, desire is really the word that sums up the woman here. There are three kinds of desire. Number one, there's the desire for intimacy. She wants to kiss him, but she also wants to go, verse 4, into his chambers. Say no more. But this is not just about empty lust. She adds, verse 3, your name is like perfume poured out. Now, in Jewish thought, somebody's name, it's not just what you call them. Bound up with your name it is your character, your reputation. So she's not just infatuated with his body, but in love with his mind. She loves his character. I think it's also interesting here that I don't think you could pigeonhole this woman either as a feminist or as a traditionalist. See, on the one hand, she's not kind of prudish and staid. She's quite happy to tell him what she wants physically. But she's also chaste. They will not consummate their relationship until they're married. Do you see Song of Songs? It's neither prudish nor pornographic. It's not embarrassed to talk about intimacy, but it knows that intimacy belongs in marriage. So she desires that intimacy, but next, she also desires security. See, as she continues, verse 5, she, she says, with a degree of insecurity, dark am I, yet lovely. And verse 6, do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me take care of the vineyards. My own vineyard I had to neglect. Her skin is dark. Now, let's be clear, this is not about race. She isn't black. She's probably not white either. She's from Israel, so she's kind of brown, I, I guess, somewhere in the middle. But the point is not about race. It's actually about class. See, the rich, posh people, they'd have had paler skin because they stayed indoors all day in soft living. But the poorer, more working class folks, they'd have been out in the fields all day working the ground or cultivating the vineyard, as she says here. And so people with, with darker skin might have been looked down upon or, or, or even seen as, as ugly because the darker your skin was, generally the poorer you were. The woman is worried that the man might not find her appealing because she's had to spend so much time cultivating the family vineyards, she hasn't had enough time, as she sees it, to, to cultivate her own beauty. 
In other words, here's a woman who feels insecure about her looks because of the false expectations and the impossibly high standards of physical beauty that society, even her own family, place upon her. This is pretty contemporary stuff, isn't it? And we'll see in a moment how the man responds to that. So she has a desire for intimacy and for security, but also, number three, a desire for companionship. Verse seven now. Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? Now, the man she loves, turns out, is a shepherd, as many people were. And the point here is that she wants to spend time with him. She wants to share life with him. She wants to share her days and not just her nights with him. They have a kind of bond, a connection, a companionship. So if you're a younger person, or even an older person, looking towards marriage... Figuring out if this person or that person might be the one to marry. Ask yourself, are we or could we be best friends? Physical attraction and intimacy is important and you know the Song of Songs doesn't shy away from that. But marriage is so much more about companionship than it is about sex. Marry someone who will be a close companion, who shares your values in life, who you want to spend time with, because you're going to spend time with them. And by the way, that's why the scriptures are clear that if you're a Christian, you should only marry another Christian. Anyway, we hear the voice of the woman here. She desires intimacy and security and companionship. But next, point two, we hear the voice, not, not of the man yet, but of the community. These are the friends of the couple about to marry. And these friends do two things. Firstly, they delight in marriage. Verse four, we rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. Wine is good, they say, but love and marriage is even better. And this is so important. It's so needed in our culture. I read an article last week in The Guardian entitled, Marriage Isn't Working. It, it was possibly the most misjudged and arrogant piece of journalism I have ever read. The, the bizarre angle it had was that that since Bill and Melinda Gates' marriage had very sadly ended, what hope was there for the rest of us? You know, if they couldn't make it work with all their money, what chance have the rest of us got? It was a bizarre and depressing article. But we are surrounded by voices like that. Voices that denigrate marriage, that talk it down, including from married people. You know, all the old jokes about the old ball and chain. It's interesting, too, that, that our culture, our, our government, rightly invests much, much time and energy into solving problems in our society, like poverty and drug use and crime and disorder and poor educational performance. And it's quite right that the government focuses on those things. But the tragedy is that time and time again, our politicians ignore the one thing that makes the biggest difference. Married, loving, stable parents and families. Study after study shows that the thing that makes the single biggest difference on all these different troubling issues is stable, loving, married parents and families. So like these friends, we live in a culture that need, needs more cheerleaders for marriage. We need to be a community that takes delight in marriage, that sees how good it is and talks it up, doesn't talk it down. So they delight in marriage, but they also help 
in marriage. This is a small point, it would be easy to miss. But did you notice when the woman asks where she can find the man to spend her days with him in companionship, it's actually the friends who answer and direct her where to go. That's verse 8. So here you have a community that values marriage enough to want to help, you might say, to support, to strengthen marriage. And that is a role that we can all and should all have, whether or not we are married ourselves, to help those who are, to understand that marriage is so good for all of us in society. Help those who are married, whether you are or not. Bear their burdens. Babysit their kids so they can enjoy time together. Be a listening ear or a shoulder to cry on in good times and in bad to help and strengthen marriages. Because those of us who are married know that it's not always easy. And help is much needed. Speak in praise of marriage. Be a helper for it. So the woman and the community have spoken and now comes the man's turn to speak. That's our third heading. Verse 9. I liken you, my darling, to a mare. Now, stop there. A mare is a horse, uh, not, not, a, not a mare as in a nightmare. Uh, but even supposing, uh, gentlemen, can I give you some polite advice? If you are looking to compliment your wife, do not compare her to a horse. That's because in our culture, imagery is visual. So if I say to Morag, my darling, I liken you to a horse, she will think I'm saying that she looks like a horse. And even though she likes horses, I don't think that would go down very well. We need to understand that, that this kind of imagery and language in ancient Hebrew culture, it's not visual, it's more metaphorical. So when he compares her to a horse, he knows, and more importantly, she knows, he's not saying that she looks like one. He's saying she is sleek and powerful and beautiful. It's not just any horse he compares her to, it's one of Pharaoh's horses, which no doubt were the costliest and most beautiful beasts of all. Anyway, he goes on, verse 10. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. So the horse he has in mind is a horse that's been decked out in finery which is how horses would have been dressed for special occasions, including weddings. So here's a reminder again that the setting for this song and the setting for sexual intimacy is marriage. On their wedding day, that's when Jewish girls would have worn jewelry, not every day. So again, that's the setting here. It also somehow seems kind of significant that at this stage of the song, before they are married, the man keeps his compliments above the woman's neckline. He refers only to her face, and even then he's subtle, because he talks about her jewelry. Men, notice that this man is not crass. He's not coarse. That's the lesson we need to learn. He, he's dignified in his compliments about her. And he assures her that whatever her insecurities, remember about her skin and all of that, to him, she's beautiful. There's a dignity in the way that he speaks to her and about her, in the way he approaches her. One Bible commentator put it this way. In the song... The woman is not a land to be conquered by the man or a field to be planted with his seed. She is a vineyard to be cultivated by him so that together they can enjoy the sweet wine of their relationship. How different relationships might be if we men particularly approached our sisters like that in respectful dialogue and wanting meaningful relationships. 
So in short, we, we look at these comments from the woman and the man, and we've not had time to go through all of them, but, but from the woman and the man and the community, and another Bible commentator says this. In all of this, already we see signs of a healthy relationship. The woman will enter this partnership with equal passion, hoping and expecting to find a man who is strong enough to lead. And as their relationship develops, they will not cut themselves off from others. They'll find strength in the counsel of their community. There's a lot to, for us to learn there, isn't there, about healthy relationships, whether we're married or not. So we've seen the man, the woman, the community. But lastly, point four, God. What does this say to us directly or, or indirectly about God? Well, all of this takes on an even deeper significance when we draw the comparison to our relationship with Jesus. Remember that wider context. This song is about a man and a woman in love, but that story is told against the bigger backdrop of the story of Scripture, where time and again the love of God for his people and the love of his people for God is pictured like a marriage. And so the astonishing truth that we'll see time and again is this. Jesus wants to share his love with every one of his people, whether they are male or female or married or single. As we come to know Jesus, we see that his name, that is his character, is truly beautiful. The gospel teaches us that, that we also were made beautiful by God and yet our lives have been darkened by sin, including our own broken and disordered sexual sin. But in the gospel we see that Christ has loved us in spite of the darkness of our sin, that he has given himself for us in total commitment to us despite the ugliness of our corrupted natures. And we see now that, that Jesus wants to satisfy our soul's deepest longings and desires in intimate relationships, not with other people, or not merely with other people, but in relationship with him, the living God himself, by washing us from the darkness of our sin and remaking us in his beautiful image. And so the longing we see pictured here between the man and the woman is meant to be a little taste of the longing we could have or should have for Jesus himself. And that he has clearly demonstrated for us in the rescue he's brought at the cross. Here's how another Bible scholar puts it and we'll end with these words. As we hope for his presence with a longing for love that the Holy Spirit may intensify until it becomes an aching desire, we tell everyone we can that we have found the one that we want, the one who loves us most of all. And like the beloved woman in the Song of Songs, we join the people of God in celebrating his undying affection. We will exult and rejoice in you. We will praise your love. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this extraordinary and surprising book. Father, we pray that as we study it in these weeks to come, we would learn more of your wisdom on love and marriage and sex and most of all about Jesus. Forgive us when our relationship with you is shallow or superficial. We pray that you would draw us deeper into a relationship of love with you. Lord, where our hearts have grown cold, we pray that by your spirit you would renew a longing, an 
aching longing in us to know you and to be known by you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, thanks for being with us. As always, come back next Sunday evening as we continue our journey.